Hi all, uh, good morning and this is Samit. You are watching me live, you are hearing me live and today we will be going further for the current affairs classes, right? Now, uh, before I move in, here we need to understand here again I have taken a different approach for teaching current affairs for today. Like for example, uh, there is a topic, okay? say for our first topic is MOD's prestigious strategic partnership model so what is MOD MOD's prestigious strategic partnership model that aims at providing significant Philip to the government's make in India program now here there are three lines right so make in India all of us know it is an initiative of the present government which was then taken in 2014-15 to basically uh, boost make in India products where MOD stands for man, uh, MOD stands for your Ministry of Defense now here what happened is the con if you go to the context the DAC that is Defense Acquisition Council the DAC okay so the DAC that is Defense acquisition council okay the defense acquisition council uh, which is a part of defense ministry who is actually uh, given an authority to pass certain amount of defense acquisition uh, materials which is a landmark decision have approved this DAC have approved a procurement of 111 utility helicopters what utility helicopters for the Indian Navy right how many 111 for Indian Navy for rupees 21,000 crores okay so this is the first project under the Ministry of Defense that is prestigious uh, this prestigious strategic partnership model that aims at providing significant Philip so that is what the model was now what is this strategic partnership right what is this model basically the strategic partner model is intended to enhance competition increase efficiencies facilitate faster and more significant absorption of technology basically to create a tired industrial ecosystem and ensure development of wider skill base trigger innovation and enable participation earlier what happened is earlier our defense equipments maximum we used to get it from outside but at present the government is looking forward to bring more competition within the country and to allow private player players even startups who are ready to take an initiative and provide a special under this model what happened is what is the facilities under this model is under this model the government intends to boost private sector participation as I have already told and create domestic expertise in four key areas basically okay uh, the four key areas where this model uh, intends is fighter aircrafts okay then uh, helicopters then of course submarines and armed vehicles battle tanks as well armed vehicles and battle tanks so this is the first model where the government is looking forward for private sector participation one company would be selected so under this scheme one company would be selected for each area based on its competence which would then tie up with the foreign original equipment manufacturer say for example in recent the Rafale deal in the Rafale deal what happened is the Rafale deal this who is the manufacturer of Rafale the manufacturer of Rafale is Dassault where it is it is in France so this is a foreign company but 
what India is doing is it is allowing private players to be joint ventures and who took the initiative? The Reliance. So Reliance as a joint venture with Dassault will be providing Rafale jets to India. So one company that is what the for they will be tying up for the with the foreign original equipment manufacturer that is OEM selected through a procurement process of course to build the platform in India with significant technology transfer. Now what is the significance of this SP model we need to understand this as well right. So from the private sector point of view if you take the from uh, if you take the point of view from the private sector the biggest benefit would be the opportunity to participate in some big ticket contracts. Uh, which is estimated to be worth over 2 lakh crore rupees in the initial phase which obviously will move forward right now apart from this there is a bridge uh, it also uh, when we go to the further significance apart from this uh, private point of view there is also bridging the trust gap like at the same time the uh, like what happened is at the same time the model would also go a long way in bridging the long standing trust gap between the Indian private sector and Ministry of Defense, which the latter perceived to be friendlier towards public sector entities. Strat strategic partners, basically this SP model, being a private sector companies are expected to exploit their dynamism, right? For example, the uh, purpose of this is to bring competitiveness. The reason is in this defense acquisition when we are procuring a heavy amount when we are procuring heavy uh, when we are investing heavy amount of money and procuring uh, the defense material here the purpose is to basically uh, to create a uh, aura of dynamism basically right then uh, competitiveness of course Then profit orientation and exposure. This is quite important above all because recently, even the startup have been taken very seriously. Even if there are uh, organization with a startup who are potential enough to take care of all those activities or can be a part of any of these activities will also be given a chance and hence will improve the participation in the defense sector as well because till now startups have been limited they were not that much allowed to get into defense but now even they are allowed if they have or any startup company have a strategic idea or have some technology with it right so this was first now coming to the second news uh, g20 digital economy ministerial meeting actually this is uh, this is a meeting to understand this we need to understand a bit of g20 right now what is g20 g20 g stands for basically group and 20 is basically what 20 countries right so this G20, why this is important? Because this G20 is an international forum for the governments and central bank governors like uh, Argentina, Australia, Brazil, Canada, China, France, Germany, India, Indonesia, Italy. Uh, then we have Japan, Mexico, Russia, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, South Korea. Uh, then Turkey, the United Kingdom, the USA and the European, right? So those are the uh, few G20 countries. The purpose is uh, basically, the purpose is basically uh, to prosperity, to prosper in peace as well as economy. And in recent, actually it was held in Argentina. The recent G20 was held in Argentina, right? So here, uh, 
we, I won't be taking much of the time going for the history. Rather, I'll tell about the organization because this G20 operates without a permanent secretary or staff. The group's chair rotates annually. Like out of these 20 countries, the chair, the group, the, the group whole, uh, this group of 20 countries will be coordinated with a particular chair. And that chair rotates annually. Every year that chair changes among the members and is selected from a different regional grouping of countries. The chair is part of a revolving three member management group of past, present and future chairs referred to as Troika. Okay, so like there are three chairs, there will be three chairs in this particular G20, which is referred to as Troika because there will be three members. One of the past, one present and of course one future the incumbent chair establishes a temporary secretariat for the duration of its term which coordinates the group's work and organization is meeting the role of the troika is basically to ensure continuity in g20 work and management across host years right so now coming back to the uh, this particular that was i was trying to tell what is g20 okay and the list of members I have already listed, right? There are 20 members. Initially, initially, uh, what happened? Initially, there were not 20 members, right? All 19 members, like few years back, it was 19 members, and recently the 20th member was joined, right? Of course, the European Union. Now, here coming back, coming back to this particular topic. Let us understand the context. Basically, in the framework of Argentina presidency, this G20 digital economy meeting, the recent G20 was held in Argentina. Right? So, the addition of digital economy, which part of Argentina also important because question may come that where it was held. So, you can write Salta. S A L T A Salta Argentina. So this digital economy, they have established this. This was established under 2017 German presidency. They have. We are talking about digital economy ministry meeting. Okay, D E T F. In simple digital economy task force. So this D. E. DF, Digital Economic Task Force, was basically established in 2017 by German presidency based on decision adopted in based on the decision adopted in Hangzhou in 2016 under the Chinese presidency. In Antalya, under the Turkish presidency, that is that was again in 2015 earlier in 2015 it was held in antalya okay antalya turkey antalya g20 leaders have recognized the modern period as a critical era of digital transformation and influenced by advent of new technology as key elements for economic development now what is this digital economy now since we are talking about digital economy let us understand what is this digital economy basically the digital economy refers to a broad range of activities which include the use of knowledge and information as factors in production information networks as a platform for action and how the information and communication technology that is ict sector spurs economic growth right so this is what this is digital economy now what are the challenges so though i have told that it is been important for it as well as production as well as platform of action for different different reasons so there are challenges as well now the important challenges which include basically providing high speed internet for all basically challenges to provide high speed internet to all by 2025 creating inclusive growth and new jobs through digital trade promoting lifelong digital learning and closing the gender gap now 
it is important to understand the importance of this basically what is why the 20 meeting was important right though already have told that uh, g20 is basically made up of uh, 20 countries but actually in actual there is a 19 full members who are running this g20 okay so the g20 uh, origin if you go back to the origin then this G20 was born out of a meeting of G7 finance ministers, basically group of seven, and central bank governors back in 1999, who saw a need for a more inclusive body with broader representation to have a stronger impact on addressing the world's financial challenges. Basically, the core idea was to uh, face the world's financial challenges and to keep move accordingly, right? Uh, when we put the global impact g20 members basically represent all inhabited continents 85 percent of global economic output basically they are two-third how much nearly 85 percent so g20 policy making is enriched by participation of key international organization regularly <coughs> invited by g20 meeting so this G20 consists of 19 participating countries as of now, right? Let us move to the next news. Recently, the third edition of Indian Ocean Conference was held at Hanoi. Where is Hanoi? It is basically the capital of Vietnam, right? Uh, let us understand few things about this Indian Ocean Conference. Indian Ocean Conference is basically initiated by India Foundation along with its path. It is, but I should write it. It is basically initiated, of course, by government with its partners. Who are the partners? The partners are Singapore, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh. Basically, it's an effort to bring together head of states, government minister through leaders, thought leaders, scholars, diplomats, bureaucrats, and practitioners from across the region. Right? Basically, this is a strategy of building regional stability and architectures, right? So this was where it was held. It was held in Hanoi. Vietnam okay you don't have to know much uh, about this but questions may come like uh, it is uh, quite uh, valid that this way such kind of questions do come with SSC right so in that case you can answer this now let us move to the next new standards to measure quality of services have been set by whom by B I Yes, that is Bureau of Indian Star Standards. So the Bureau of Indian Standards has kicked off the process to set new standards to measure quality of services offered to consumers across, across different sectors, right? Across different sectors. And which are those? Those include telecom, aviation, e-commerce, and healthcare. In this regard, BIS had recently called a meeting of industry bodies to persuade them to be part of the process and give their inputs. Getting to the significance, now before we get into the significance, we need to know a bit about uh, BIS, right? So that is Bureau of Indian Standards. BIS is that is Bureau of Indian Standards is the national standards body of India 
working under the aegis of Ministry of Consumer Affairs, Food and Public Distribution. It was established basically uh, by the Bureau of Indian Standards Act 1986. In 1986, it was established as a Bureau of Indian Standards Act. The minister in charge of this department is the ex officio president of the BIS in general. Okay, as a corporate body, it has 25 members drawn from central and state governments, industries, scientific and research institutions, and consumer organization. Okay, uh, getting to the background on uh, an online survey, I have found that uh, in the absence of deficient customer service standards in the country a majority of consumers were not happy with after sales service as per the poll 43 percent feel that mobile handset and computer manufacturers are the worst in after sales services followed by white good firms that is 38 percent and automobile companies around 11 percent about 93 percent of respondents said brand should at least acknowledge the complaints from users within 72 hours many consumers complain that consumer service numbers of many companies do not work so service sector is one of the key area of the indian economy so it is quite relevant and significant that it should be provided so the demands were like service will be provided within 72 hours so bis is working for the same now going to the next topic the next topic is national tiger conservation authority to revive the plan to reintroduce cheetahs in the state noradai sanctuary right the Madhya Pradesh Foreign, it is basically the Madhya Pradesh Forest Department because this Nora Day Sanctuary is in Madhya Pradesh. And this ambitious project was conceived in 2009 and hit a roadblock for word of fund. Basically, it lacked funds. Fact is that the cheetah, right, the Akinox jubatus. The scientific name is one of the oldest of the big cat species with ancestors that can be traced back more than 5 million years ago. They can be traced more than 5 million years, right? The cheetah is also the world's fastest land mammal. Cheetah is the fastest land mammal okay with great speed and naturality the cheetah is known for being an excellent hunter it kills feeding many other animals in its ecosystem ensuring that multiple species survive the country's last spotted Feline dead in Chhattisgarh in 1947. Later, the cheetah, which is the fastest land animal, was declared extinct in India in 1952. Around 1952, they have almost extinct. But the Wildlife Institute of India, which is situated at Dehradun, where wildlife, those are the important points, Wildlife Institute of India question have been asked where it is situated it is situated in Dehradun. so the wildlife institute of india at Dehradun had prepared around 260 crore cheetah reintroduction project six years ago and it was estimated that an amount of 25 crore to 30 crore would be needed to build an enclosure in an area of 150 square kilometer for cheetahs in noradi the proposal was to put the felines in the enclosure with a huge boundary walls being released in the wild. Now, what they have done is, 
Nora D was found to be most suitable area, right? Why we are talking about Nora D? Because Nora D have been found as the most suitable area for the cheetahs, as its forests are not very dense to restrict the fast movement of the spotted cat. Besides, the prey base for cheetahs is also in abundance. Here, basically, the prey base was in abundance. According to the earlier action plan, around 20 cheetahs were to be translocated. So here what happened, 20, it was the, as per the action plan, 20 cheetahs were to be translocated to tra Noradai. From where? From Nambia in Africa. The Nambia Cheetah Conservation Fund had then showed its willingness to donate the felines to India. However, the state was not ready to finance the plan, contending that it was the center's project. Okay, state government uh, it conflicted with the center because telling that it was a center's uh, fund, center should be doing that. So the project was in hold. Uh, background if you go to the background. The reasons for extinctions can be traced to man's interference, problems like uh, human uh, wildlife conflict, loss of habitat and loss of prey, illegal trafficking have decimated the numbers, the advent of climate change and growing human populations have also only made these problems worse with less uh, availability of land for wildlife species that require vast home range like cheetah are placed in competi competition with other animals and humans all fighting over less space because cheetah is losing uh, its forest as humans as human population is increasing and land area is decreasing right so the uh, so the reintroduction of cheetahs will help restore India's open forest and grassland ecosystem which have been suffering. Having cheetahs will result in greater biodiversity and biodiversity is the hallmark of healthy ecosystem. And hence India is also home to world's largest free roaming population of livestock. Livestock uh, bringing back the cheetah will focus attention on pastoralism and doing so will whole help restore India's natural heritage because uh, as of now we are almost in the extreme almost the cheetahs are extinct right so it is important coming to this national Ti uh, tiger conservation authority that is this NTCA right NTCA is basically a statutory body under the under the Ministry of uh, Environment, Forest and Climate Change, which constituted under enabling provisions of Wildlife Protection Act. Okay, so this is under Wildlife Protection Act 1972. This is a very important act, Wildlife Protection Act, as amended in 2000. Six. This was latest amended in 2006 for strengthening tiger conservation as per powers and function assigned to it. Right now, we'll move to the next topic. Next is India's first biofuel powered plane that was flew by SpiceJet. So the topic therefore is Spicejet flew the Bombardier Q400 on biofuel from Dehradun to Delhi. India has now joined this small league of nations with the US and Australia which have already taken initiative to fly biofuel powered aircraft. Biofuel flights actually could make air travel cleaner and more efficient and thus drastically reduce the cost of airline operation by reducing the dependency on ATF that is aviation turbine fuel. The biofuel is made partially from renewable sources such as agricultural residues, non-edible oils uh, and biodegradable fractions. 
of industrial and municipal wastes, right? So those uh, have been uh, quite important parts. Now, the next is August 23. August 23 was celebrated as International Day for the remembrance of the slave trade and its abolition. Right? What is the significance for the day? Basically, this day is commemorated to pay tribute to all those who fought for freedom and worked hard to abolish the slave trade and slavery throughout the world. This commitment and the actions used to fight against the system of system of slavery, basically to fight against the system of slavery and had an impact on human rights movement. When I'm talking about human rights, Article 14 comes into picture, right? A right to equality. Here, there are, have been few steps that were taken by the UNESCO basically to honor the history of the slave trade and the abolition. UNESCO, that is United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization in 2017 had added to its world heritage list the Mamba, Manza, sorry, Banja, Congo, which vestiges of the capital of former kingdom of Congo and the Velongo Waf archaeological site Brazil as an acknowledgement of the outstanding universal value. So UNESCO has started an initiative in 1994 known as Slave Root Project. Back in UNESCO, it was started in by UNESCO back in 1994 known as the Slave Root Project to contribute to a better understanding of the causes. Uh, basically, the height and uh, the contribution were the reasons were because of uh, if you go back, there are many in fact, but if I go for the Haitian revolution, the night of August 22 and 23, 19, uh, sorry, 1791, inside Domingo, in what is Haiti and Dominican Republic today, saw the beginning of uprising that would play a crucial role in the abolition. So, basically, the fact. And the significance and finally the objective of celebrating this 23rd August as International Day basically to eradicate eradicate slavery. So the important thing is when it is celebrated, it is on August 23rd. This is very, very important. Question may come that when in the, in the International Day for Remembrance of Slave Trade is observed right next is sweden has released a handbook of his feminist foreign policy what are the highlights of this manual basically the manual is derived from four years of work to place gender equality basically here this is for gender equality right gender equality the agenda is gender equalities. Sweden began its feminist foreign policy in response to discrimination and systematic subordination that still mark the daily lives of countless women and girls around the world. Its goals include the promotion of economic emancipation, fighting sexual violence and improving women's, women's uh, political participation. Projects cited in the manual include an action plan for five war-torn and post-conflict nations. Afghanistan, Colombia, Democratic Republic of Congo, Liberia, and the Palestinian territories building in targets for women's rights and empowerment for the first time. And the hand handbook highlights Sweden's work in Congo to promote positive masculinity in the country where it is has run initiatives such as promoting social media debate on men's role in society when we go way ahead it's too early to draw any conclusion about whether the feminist approach leads to significant change but in simple 
this is about gender equality questions may come question may come that what is the significance or what is the objective of this feminist foreign policy which have released a handbook by sweden right so the answer for this will be gender equality basically gender equality when we are talking about gender equality equality in terms of pay equality in terms of treatment irrespective of the gender right next is uh, this odisha government have approved a proposal for setting up a legislative council in the state now what are the legislative council and why are they important india as we know has a bicameral system that is two houses of parliament so at the state level the equivalent of the lok sabha is the vidhan sabha or legislative assembly that of the rajya sabha is the vidhan parishad or legislative council right so government had the odisha government as of now had only legislative assembly so it have proposed a legislative council a second house of legislature is considered important for two reasons right why this is uh, considered as important one is to act as a check on hasty actions by popularity elected house and two to ensure that individuals who might not be cut out for the rough and tumble of direct elections too are able to contribute to the legislative process why do we need a second house now the question uh, can be asked that why we need a second house like already we have a legislative assembly right why we need a legislative council here opposition to the idea of legislative council is centered on three broad arguments first they can be used to park leaders who have not been able to win an election right two they can be used to delay progressive legislation and three they would strain straight finances opinion in the constituent assembly was divided on the question of having a legislative council the idea was backed on the above grounds it was also suggested that having a second chamber would allow for more debate and sharing of work between the houses now when the creation of legislative council came basically article 169 now what is important over here is there are state governments are allowed to have two legislative one is legislative assembly and one is legislative council so this legislative council is allowed under article 169 article 169 of the constitution uh provides by law where parliament may by law create or abolish the second chamber in a state if the legislative assembly of the state passes a resolution to that effect by a special majority as of now as per article 171 okay of the indian constitution the total number of members in the legislative council of state so not here apart from article 169 in this context one more article comes that is article 171 what this says this says that the total number of members in the legislative council of a state shall not exceed one third of the total number of members in the legislative assembly of that state and the total number of members in the legislative council of state shall in no case be less than 40 the exception is jammu and kashmir where the legislative council has 36 members wide section 50 of the constitution of the state so it is telling that as per article 171 article 169 gives authority 
to the state government to go for this legislative council, right? Whereas Article 171 says it can be maximum of one third from the legislative assembly population and maximum to 40. Okay. However, it is an exception in Jammu and Kashmir. Jammu and Kashmir have only 36, not 40. So how are the members of the council elected? About one third of the members are elected by members of the assembly, that is legislative assembly. Another one third of the electorates consisting of members of municipalities, district boards, and other local authorities in the state. Whereas one by 12th by an electorate consisting of teachers and one by 12 by registered graduates, the remaining members are nominated by the governors, governor for, from among those who have distinguished themselves in literature, science, art, the cooperative movement, and social service. Legislative councils are permanent houses, and like Rajya Sabha, one third of the members retire every two years. So, in that context, let me uh, again come to a point like do Rajya Sabha and Vidhan Parishad have similar powers? Like it is a Rajya Sabha for the state governments, right? It's a second house, but not exactly, not really. The constitution gives constitu uh, council limit, limited legislative powers. Unlike Rajya Sabha, which has substantial powers to save non-financial legislation, like Rajya Sabha cannot do cannot do a legislation in finance, but definitely non-finance can do a great work. Legislative council lacks the constitutional mandate to do so, and hence legislative assemblies have the power to override suggestions, amendments made to a legis uh, legislation by the council. Also, while Rajya Sabha MPs can vote in the election of the president and vice president, members of legislative council can't. So MLCs also can't vote in the elections of Rajya Sabha members, right? So those are the few things one need to keep in mind while going through such topics. So here the important points were Article 169 and Article 171. Right? When we're talking about Article 169, 179, and we're talking about the constitution of the particular state, then again, Article 370 also comes into picture, right? That is Jammu and Kashmir. And when it comes, 370 comes, even 335A also comes into picture, right? Which restricts outsider to buy land in Jammu and Kashmir. Whereas Article 370 is the self constitution of the state. Next. Center has proposed and has approved construction of nearly 1.12 lakh more affordable houses under this PMAY, that is Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana Urban. It was basically launched by the Ministry of Housing and Urban Poverty Alleviation, uh, Mission Mode Invasions. Provision of housing for all okay 2020. It was under the agenda housing for all 2022 when the nation completes 75 years of its independence. The mission basically seeks to address the housing requirement of urban poor, including some dwellers, through following program like slum rehabilitation of slum dwellers with participation of private developers using land as a resource promotion of affordable housing for weaker section through credit link subsidy affordable housing in partnership with public and private sectors subsidy for beneficiary led individual house construction or enhancement uh, the key facts of this particular, so here housing for all, this is housing for all by 2022. Uh, the beneficiary of this are basically the poor people who are quite ineligible to buy 
houses right so the beneficiary are poor and people living under ews and lig categories in the country the scheme is divided into three phases the first phase a total of 100 cities will be covered from april 2015 to 17 so there are how many phases three phases i should better mention first phase is 2015 to 2017 which have already won okay so here the agenda was 100 cities then the phase 2 that is 2017 right basically this is april 2017 to march 2019 this is to cover 200 extra cities right and finally 2019 to 22 the rest clear so the government is providing an annual subsidy of 6.5 percent government is providing a subsidy of 6.5 percent on housing loans which can be availed by beneficiary for 15 years from the start of loan date the government will grant rupees 1 lakh to all the beneficiary of the scheme in addition rupees 1.5 lakh will be given to all eligible urban poor who want to construct the houses in urban areas a plan to go for renovation of the existing houses one can also avail loads under this scheme to build toilets in existing houses. Under this scheme, one can also uh, take a loan for building toilets, right? Next is 2018 SCO Peace Mission Exercise. So what is this SCO? SCO, what uh, is it? SCO is basically uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization and also known as Shanghai Pact. It is also known as Shanghai Pact, that is Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Okay. It is a Eurasian political, economy, and military organization which was founded in 2001 in Shanghai by the leaders of China, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, Tajikistan and Uzbekistan. Apart from Uzbekistan, the other five countries have been a part of the Shanghai Five since 1996. The cooperation was renamed to Shanghai Cooperation Organization after Uzbekistan joined the organization in 2000. One, the new members in SEO, that is Shanghai Cooperation Organization, are India and Pakistan, who joined as full members in June 2017 in Astana, that is in Kazakhstan. The main goals are basically uh, the main goals of SEO is to strengthen mutual trust and neighborliness among the member states, promoting their effective cooperation in politics, trade the economy, research, technology, and culture, as well as in education, energy, transport, tourism, making joint efforts to maintain and ensure peace, security, and stability in the region and moving towards the establishment of a democratic, fair, and a rational new international political economic order. And this significance, the significance will be like the previous, uh, the previous SEO, Counterterrorism drills were mainly limited to Central Asian notions. But due to the entry of India and Pakistan, the SEO's counterterrorism mission has expanded to South Asia. In 2018 exercise, it will be first for India and Pakistan since becoming full members to participate. It also will be the first time India and Pakistan take part in military exercise together. This will be the first time India and Pakistan will be taking military exercise together under this SCO flagship. As a part of SCO initiative, so what is important is uh, it is earlier called a Shanghai Pact. Uh, India and Pakistan, which have been recently inducted in June 2017 for the first time, have been 
a part of a team in a military exercise under this SEO Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Okay, so at least 3,000 soldiers from China, Russia, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, India, and Pakistan are participating in that drill. How many? 3,000 soldiers, right? Next. Commute related pollution Kolkata signs among mega cities. Yes. In a recent survey, Kolkata is a top performing mega city. Bhopal leads the list on the lowest overall emissions. In coming to overall emission, Bhopal leads the list. Delhi and Hyderabad are the two cities that are far bottom. So the bottom list are Delhi and Hyderabad are the two cities that fare at bottom. Whereas Kolkata is the top performing mega city, right? As I have already told, in terms of overall emissions and energy consumption, Bhopal was followed by Vijayawada. Kolkata, which comes in as a sixth place on overall emissions, was among the six mega cities. In fact, smaller cities such as Ahmedabad and Pune ranked below Kolkata for overall emissions. Okay, Delhi ranked worst. Concern. Now, what is the concern for this topic and what is the importance? The motorization in India is explosive. Initially, it took 60 years for India to cross 105 million registered vehicles. Thereafter, the same number of vehicles were added in a mere six years. Like in 60 years, what I mean to say is in 60 years, that is 1951 to 2008. Okay, one five one zero five million motor were registered, vehicles were registered, but the same number that is one hundred five. This was in sixty years. Okay, sixty years, but in recent, in only six years, this many vehicles have been added. So it is obviously a concern and a reason for this pollution in cities. The relation to study is the importance of public transport independent uh, of income label. Meanwhile, uh, like uh, why I'm talking about the importance of public transport because Kolkata provides a resounding message that despite population growth and rising travel demand, it is possible to contain motorization. This is possible only with a, a well-established public transport culture, compact city design, uh, high street density, and restricted availability of land for roads and parking. Both Kolkata and Mumbai have grown the unique advantage of a public transport spine well integrated with existing land use patterns. So Mumbai had the highest GDP but a lower rate of motorization compared with other mega cities providing that income levels were not only not the only reason for deciding of population dependence on automobiles right next is article 35a of the constitution is now being vigorously contested with its constitutional validity being challenged before the Supreme Court. Before I go further or move further, let us go by this paper cut, which states a look at Article 35A, whose constitutional validity has been challenged in the Supreme Court, right? So Article 35A, what is this Article 35A? Article 35A is something to do with Jammu and Kashmir, right? Was incorporated into the constitution by the president order on the advice of cabinet 
1954. Order, now, what is this order of 94? Followed by 1952, Delhi Agreement between Jawaharlal Nehru and the then JNK Prime Minister Sheikh Abdullah, which extended Indian citizenship extended Indian citizenship to the state subjects of Jammu and Kashmir. What is the significance is Article 35A basically bars non-JNK residents from buying property in the state and ensures job reservation. State decides permanent residence. It is the state Jammu and Kashmir which will decide the permanent residence. Article 35A, as I have told, that decides. Now, how did it come about? Basically, Article 35A, this is a controversial constitution. Uh, order of 1954 followed by 1952, as we have already understood. The presidential order that was issued under Article 370, which deals with the constitution of Jammu and Kashmir, this provision allows the president to make certain exceptions and modifications to the constitution for the benefit of state subjects of Jammu and Kashmir. So, Article 35A was added to the constitution as a testimony of the special constitution the Indian government according to the permanent residence of Jammu and Kashmir. Now why we need to review this is the classification which was created by Article 35A has to be tested on the principle of equality as it treats non-permanent residents of Jammu and Kashmir as second class citizens. Now point to be noted here is Article 35A has to be tested on the principle of equality as it Treats non permanent residents, right? Non permanent residents means non Jammu and Kashmir people as second class citizen. Such persons are not eligible for employment under the state government and are also debarred from contesting elections. Meritorious students are denied scholarships and they cannot even seek redress in any court of law. The major sufferers are women who marry outside who marry outside Jammu and Kashmir. Though they retain their permanent resident certificate, the children cannot be permanent residents. This restricts their basic right of inheritance. Further, the issues of refugees who migrated to Jammu and Kashmir, Jammu and Kashmir during partition are still not rated as state subjects as the JNK constitution. Now how we can go in future the way ahead this matter actually requires the active participation of all stakeholders it may be the government of India the state government it is necessary to give confidence to the residents of JNK that any alteration in status quo will not take away their rights but will boost Jammu and Kashmir prosperity as it will open doors for more investment resulting in new opportunities right so article 35a which was incorporated about six decades ago now requires a relook especially given that Jammu and Kashmir is now a well established democratic state right so that is the importance. Next is CGI launches application to facilitate litigants and lawyers. Who is citizens? Who is CGI? CGI is Chief Justice of India, right? So CGI have uh, basically three new applications have been launched for the benefits of litigations and lawyers as of now three applications have been launched for litigation and lawyers 
the application is meant for online registration of lawyers and litigants through the application one can file cases from any part of india to any court on registration okay portfolio management of cases of litigants and lawyers is provided on the portal and one can get updates from time to time about filed cases and cases under objection or rejected cases basically the significance is e filing application e pay application right uh, the otp authentication process secure way is basically for financial transaction and one can get instant acknowledgments through sms and print receipts uh, coming to national service and tracking of electronic processes it is launched as part of e codes project it is basically e code project uh, it is transparent and secure system from transmission of process from one location to another and will address delays in process it offers facility to send electronic processes directly to registered mail of the addressee by secure mechanism which enables uploading of documents associated with process and facilities like tracking gps obtaining photograph and on screen signature coming to the e code projects uh, the e codes mission mode project is a national e governance project right the major objective of the project are to make whole judicial system ict enabled right by putting in place adequate and modern hardware and connectivity automation of workflow management in all courts electronic movement of records from taluka trial to appear appeal courts installation of video conferencing facility and recording of witness through video conferencing specific targets are set under the project which includes computerization of all the codes and dlsa and tlsc wan and cloud connectivity in 3500 code complexes basically this is a move <coughs> sorry to initiate 3500 code complexes to internet enable right finally the last topic for the day is sustainable development in Indian Himalaya region. Niti Ayog has basically Niti Ayog is basically a planning initiative of government of India that is national integration of transforming India. Niti Ayog has launched five reports five thematic reports on sustainable development in Indian Himalaya region. The reports from the five working groups discuss the significance, the challenges, the ongoing actions and a future roadmap. Recognizing the uniqueness of the Himalayas and the challenges for sustainable development, it has started five groups, right? The themes are like the five, what are the five? First one, the inventory and revival of springs in Himalaya for water security. Water security. So the revival of springs. Second is sustainable tourism in Indian Himalaya regions. Second is sustainable tourism in Indian Himalaya regions. Transformative approach to sifting cultivation, right? Sifting cultivation, strengthening skill and entrepreneurship landscape. Fourth is skill, and the last one is data or information for informed decision making. Fifth is data or information so these are the five working groups who are working 
for the uniqueness of Himalaya for a sustainable development. Why this is a challenge? Because nearly 30% of springs crucial to water security of people are drying and 50% have reported reduced discharge. Himalaya tourism growing annually at 6.8% has created huge challenge related to solid water, water traffic, loss of bioculture, diversity, etc. Important recommendation which can be made is uh, spring mapping and revival using a eight state protocol that can be later carried out uh, with the state of state government as well as central government. The call for action include setting up a Himalayan authority. We need to set up authority for coordinating and holistic development of entire Himalaya region right uh, apart from this the reforms which need is with the projected arrival of tourists nowadays uh, the tourists have increased in Himalaya regions to more than double by 2025 urgent actions will be needed to address critical issues of waste management and water crisis in addition to other environmental and social issues. In the northeastern states, thousands of the households continue to practice slush and burn that need to be addressed in view of ecological, food and nu nutritional security. Predominantly unskilled workforce remains a challenge for the mountains as well that need high priority to address migration of youths. Also challenges related to data availability, data authenticity, compatibility, data quality, validation, user charges for Himalaya states, which need addressing for informed decision making at different levels of governance, right? So those are the few important things one need to understand while going to the particular topics right so this was all about the current affairs for today and then the next will be move into the editorial understanding right the very first in this editorial, I will go first with Kerala floods, right? What happened in Kerala now is definitely a huge loss in terms of life and property, right? But in the same time, we have come across a lot of heroes who have been constantly very much aggressive to help the state to come up when I'm talking about come the statement for the life so that again a new beginning can be started here there are few recommendations by the Gadgil committee Kerala for basically it is the prescription of Western card okay so this was given by Gadgil Committee. Why this Gadgil Committee was set up? Basically in February 2010, in February 2010, these are the facts which I'm producing you probably you would have never gone through. So it is important for you to understand that in February 2010, then Environment Minister in Tamil Nadu, organized mainly by those associated with Save the Western Ghat group. It was basically to save the Western Ghat group. The panel was asked to make an assessment of the ecology and biodiversity of the Western Ghat and suggested measures to conserve, protect, and rejuvenate the entire range that stretch over 150, 1500 kilometer, basically, which is stretch. This is basically for the Western Ghat, which was stretch to 150, 1500 kilometer along the coast, right? 
with its footprints in Gujarat, Maharashtra, Goa, Karnataka, Kerala, and Tamil Nadu. So what this Gadgil committee says, it defines the boundaries of the Western Ghats for the purposes of ecological management. It proposed that this entire area be designated as ecological sensitivity area. Within this area, smaller regions were to be identified as ecologically sensitive zones 1, 2 or 3 based on their existing condition and nature of threat. It proposed to divide the area about 2200 grids of which 75% would fall under ESJ that is ecological sensitive zone or under already existing protected areas such as wildlife sanctuaries or national parks. The committee proposed a Western Guards Ecological Authority. Okay, so what this comment, uh, committee talks is Gadigal committee has eminent ecologist and the report to reflect that the report was labeled favorable to environment and environment list, right? So this was the Western Ghat ecological expert who designated the entire hill, entire hill region an ecological sensitive area. The panel has classified 152 talukas in the Western Ghat boundary into ESZ, ecological sensitive zones, one, two, three, right? Almost all development activities like mining, thermal, etc. were restricted. They, this particular activities are restricted. Gadigal recommend, uh, report recommended that no new dams based on large scale storage be permitted in the ecological sensitive zone since both the artipelli of Kerala and Gundia of Karnataka hydroproject sites fall in ecological sensitivity zone. This project should not be accorded environmental clearances. Gadigal committee report signifies that present system of governance of the environment should be changed, right? The commission recommends constitution of a uh, Western Ghats Ecology Authority, right? So apart from this, ban on the cultivation of genetically modified in the entire area is banned plastic bags to be phased out in three years, no new special economic zones or hill station to be allowed, ban on conservation of public lands to private lands, no new mining licenses, no new dams, no new polluting industries, no new railway lines, strict regulation of tourism, cumulative impact assessment, phase out of chemical pesticides within five to eight years of ESG, those are the few important recommendation of Gadigal committee. Similarly, there was also a Kasturi, uh, Kasturi Rangan committee, right? Like none of the six concerned states agreed with the recommendation of Gadigal committee, which was submitted in August 2011. So this Gadigal recommendation was submitted in 2011, but none of the state have agreed. So, in 2012, the Environment Ministry constituted a high-level working group on Western, uh, Western Ghats under, under Kasturi Rangan to examine the Gadigal Committee report in holistic and multidisciplinary fashion, in the light of responses. Its, uh, its report revealed that of nearly 1750 responses, it had examined 81% when not in favor of Gadgil recommendations. In particular, Kerala had objected to the proposed ban on sand mining and quarrying restriction on transportation infrastructure and wind energy projects as well as hydroelectric projects. So what Kasturi Rangan committee have uh, recommended? A ban on mining, quarrying and sand mining. No new thermal power projects but hydro power projects were allowed with frictions, a ban on new polluting industries, building and construction projects up to 20,000 square meter was to be allowed but township were to be banned. Forest diversion could be allowed with extra safeguards. So 
that was a change with the gadgil committee so from this gadgil committee recommendation which was not accepted by the state in 2011 in 2012 it was kasturi rangan committee which have come up with other few terms right so those are the few things one need to keep in mind going through this now next is sovereignty and sensitivity of india and bhutan relations right why it is important bhutan have been a very all weather friend of india or we can say the vice versa when we go for the brief history when we go to the brief history of this india bhutan bhutan uh, before that let us uh, revise a bit capital of bhutan is thimphu t h i m p u thimphu and currency is gold drop even indian currency is uh, even indian currency is taken over there so uh, indian bhutan share cordial relations it is based on a share culture or uh, cultural heritage from historical past by our honorable prime minister honorable prime minister india bhutan relationship is like milk and water they cannot be separated bhutan signed a treaty with british india in 1910 according to the treaty so bhutan have signed a treaty important facts is in 1910 bhutan signed a treaty according to this treaty british guided the defense and foreign affairs of bhutan bhutan was the first country to recognize india's independence in 1947 so bhutan was the first to recognize india independent india bhutan treaty of friendship and cooperation was signed in 1949 this treaty was again updated in 2007 diplomatic relations between the two countries were officially established in 1968 after the appointment of an india of a india indian representative as a resident in thimphu the capital of bhutan india bhutan trade and commerce agreement was signed in 1972 it provided for free trade and commerce between the two countries so india has been an all weather friend of bhutan since the later independence it was india who who supported bhutan's admission in the united nation and has been with the tiny himalaya nation since decades assisting it for having a distinct palace in the global sphere assured by india for its distinct identity and autonomy since india's independence bhutan has been in the good book of since the very beginning through which exceptional aberrations in bilateral relations even is smaller than nepal in size and population bhutan is mostly dependent on india its southern neighbor with which it has greater ge geographical and socio cultural proximity the national assembly of bhutan basically was dissolved as an interim gov government was appointed this month ahead of the election which will be completed by october end marking 10 years of democracy in bhutan the bro that is border roads organization which helps bhutanese roads under project dantak decided in july to make reflective strikers on the road sides and railings in shades of indian tricolor it raised red flags among the bhutanese on social media citizens were worried that this was an attempt by india to impose its flag on its on their countryside eventually the stickers were changed to blue and white in april last year the departments of roads had to remove a board which read dantak welcomes you to bhutan at the paro international aircraft airport on a at arshel highway another board that created the government of india have to be painted over the incident was a blip in india bhutan relations but it is clear indicator of heightened sensitivity in the himalayan kingdoms as it heads to the third general election 
Coming to the sovereignty and self-sufficiency for Bhutan, the present Bhutanese government achieved a 8% GDP growth along with its construction and tourist boom in Bhutan. They were successful in stabilizing the rupee gold drum crisis as well as the economic reforms. But Bhutan failed to curb the national debt owed mostly to India for hydropower loans. Competing parties in the forthcoming elections are giving top priorities to sovereignty, security and self-sufficiency of Bhutan. This election comes days after India-China standoff in 2017 in the Bhutan claimed area of Doklam. Therefore, the election candidates advocate a Bhutanese foreign policy that is less dependent on India. Apart, uh, another party has a similar worded campaign and so on, right? Uh, in recent, what comes to Bhutan is a Roklam crisis. Uh, but uh, finally, after going through all the phases, it is clear that Bhutan plays a very prominent role uh, coming to the strategy of India, right? So China also shares a border around 470 kilometers. So China does not have official diplomatic relations with Bhutan. The biggest issue between India and Bhutan will remain how to deal with China. Because the, in recent, the Doklam issue, the Doklam crisis have brought this in news. Right? Next is the federal strengthening the federal link here we need to understand the problem that a state finance commission faces right one on the left where there is center state and local bodies dependent on finance there are functions for running education, health, roads, water, and etc. by these bodies, right? So these bodies need money or finance for running this particular welfare. So that is why state finance commissions is a unique institution which was created by the 73rd and 74th constitutional amendments, right? At a regular interval of five years under Article 243, okay, state finance commissions are to be constituted. Importance is obviously to safeguard the finance uh, needs. Present state and state finance commission. Uh, like article 243 here the important term is article 243 article 243 of the constitution that mandates the state governor to constitute a finance commission within one year of the constitutional amendment came to force till date only assam himachal pradesh tamil nadu and kerala have submitted a fifth as uh, this financial commission reports many states are yet to cross the third sfc state the seriousness, regularity, acceptance, and recommendation and the implementations are co conspicuously absent. And moreover, the composition of subsidy reveal the overwhelming presence of some or retired bureaucrats rather than academics. Problem faced by subsidies are basically subsidies that is, uh, state finance commission normally could not do this, or uh, although some have chosen for UFC path. Now the planning commission has been dismantled, right? Now it is taken care by Niti Ayog. So article 243 have been revived, amended from I to G then to W, right? So here there is nothing much to understand, but one thing is that, that the SFC here, what is, important fact is 
that I should mention so that you will be more clear. Uh, here the fact is this SFC that is State Finance Commission at a regular of interval of every five years they have to be constituted. The purpose is to assign it the task of reviewing the financial position. Basically this is to review the financial position, right? To look at the grants also a part to look into the grants, financial grants and conformity acts. Okay. So with exam point of view, you can keep these things in mind. Otherwise, it is a too big, which is not necessary, right? So we'll move to the next topic. The story to fight leprosy. Here, we need to go with this chart. In the success story in eradicating leprosy, and that is where Mother Teresa have emerged as a god for leprosy patients. In 1955, National Leprosy Control Program launched. Then again, the next was in 1983, followed by this was first. Then comes National Leprosy Education Program was launched. Then in the same year, again, multi-drug therapy was launched. Then in 2005, leprosy at national level on 31st December was achieved. Then again in 2012, special action plays for 209 high endemic districts were launched. Again in 2016, three prolonged strategy for early detections were launched. And again in the same year, this case detection campaign was launched. Leprosy is basically a chronic infectious disease which is caused by Mycobacterium leprae. It usually affects the skin and peripheral nerves but has a wide range of clinical manifestations. The disease is characterized by long incubation period, generally five to seven years, and is classified as pauki bacillary or multi bacillary depending on the bacillary load. Uh, over 110 central and state laws laws discriminate against leprosy patients. These laws stigmatize and isolate leprosy patients and coupled with age-old beliefs about leprosy cause the patients untold suffering. According to WHO, that is World Health Organization, leprosy affected 2,12,000 people globally in 2015. India alone reported India alone reported 1,27,326 cases, nearly 60% globally, out of which 8.9% were children. So, a personal loss amendment bill 2018 was seek to make a start of amending new status. It attempts to end the discrimination against leprosy. Pers uh, persons in various central laws, the Divorce Act 1869, the Resolution of Muslim Marriage Act 1939, the Special Marriage Act 1954, the Hindu Marriage Act 1955, and the Hindu Adoption and Maintenance Act 1956. The bill eliminates leprosy as a ground for dissolution of marriage or divorce. Right? Earlier, so this bill eliminates, eliminates leprosy. It cannot be a reason for the dissolution of marriage or divorce. So what are the initiative taken is the government announced the three pronged strategy for early detection of leprosy cases 
in the community which was introduced in 2016 under the national health mission under the national health mission right that is nhm and hm national health mission especially in the hard to reach areas a special leprosy case detection campaign was carried in 2016 right already mentioned as a result more than 32 cases were confirmed and put on treatment in addition persons who are in close contacts with the patients were also given medicine to reduce the chances of occurrence and finally coming to the conclusion there is a need to call for a collective effort to completely eliminate the treatable disease of leprosy from India. Anti-leprosy day was celebrated all over India on 30 January, right? So the important term here is 30 January is celebrated all over India as anti-leprosy day. What? Anti-leprosy day. Anti-leprosy day is celebrated on 30 January every year. On this event, a campaign named as Spurs, a campaign named as Spurs awareness campaign is organized in all Gram Sabhas all through the nation. Mahatma Gandhi had an enduring concern for people afflicted with leprosy. And his vision was not just to treat them, but also to bring them to mainstream to our society. India, which is among the endemic countries, has been advised to include strategic invent, uh, interventions in national plans to meet the new targets, such as screening all close contacts of person affected by leprosy, promoting a shorter and uniform treatment regimen, and incorporating specific interventions against stigmatization and discrimination as a country we have to leave no stone unturned to not just reach the last mile but also to work together to eliminate the social stigma and with this we will put today's class here and we'll meet again tomorrow with new topics till then take care have a good day.